Hey everyone, so it's been almost exactly one year since I published my innocuous little Flat Earth debunk as part of my astronomy series. This time I'd like to offer some challenges to you remaining few that are desperately clinging to this dying fad to derive some semblance of self-worth. Let's call them 10 Challenges for Flat Earthers. These will be some basic things that anyone could do to test the validity of the Flat Earth Hypothesis. These are so mind-numbingly obvious that the fact that you don't do them is an immediate indicator of your complete lack of intellectual integrity. Okay, the first thing I notice about this guy is he sounds like a little spoiled teenage girl who thinks she already knows everything. Not to mention the fact that he is in a bedroom with the door closed and an entertainment center in the background a poster of a rock band on the wall and a keyboard on the table. Once again, reminds me of a teenager. Let's get started and you'll see what I mean. Number one, here's the flat earth map that you all seem to agree upon. Anyone with half a brain can immediately tell that this does not correlate with reality. But for those with an even smaller fraction, let's do a few things to prove it. For example, make a scale. You know, a scale. It's that thing on maps that tells you how far away things are from each other. Okay, he says this is the flat earth map that everyone agrees upon. And then says anyone with half of a brain can tell that this doesn't correlate with reality. So, let's just take a look and see who correlates with this map being reality. Okay, here is the Hammond's Air Age map from 1943. All those little red lines you see are all the flight patterns from 1943. And here we have the American School of the Air map from 1947. All those little red lines are all the flight patterns from that year. And here we have another Air Age map with the flight patterns on it from 1950. And here we have the United Nations logo with the same map. And here we have the UN flag with the same map. And here we have the United Nations General Assembly Hall with the same map on the wall in the background. And the Meteorological Organization, International Maritime Organization, even the World Health Organization, they all have this map in their logo. And I could go on and on, but the point is all these organizations and government agencies seem to correlate with this map as reality. And I would say that we all agree that these agencies and organizations are a lot smarter and a lot more important than this guy. And that alone debunks his comment of the map correlating with reality. Now let's move on. For example, make a scale. You know, a scale? It's that thing on maps that tells you how far away things are from each other. Look at this map. There's a scale. You can pick two cities and determine the approximate distance between them. Then you can drive your car from one to another and verify that it is the correct distance. Now back to your little map. Okay, now he's talking about using a scale on a real map for distances. Now, any professor knows that any world map is not correct at all. For instance, check this out. You're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. That's because maps are lying to you. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. It's just a common belief that maps are absolute, conclusive, and indisputable. People tend to believe maps because by and large they work for them. They are accepted as fact. We see over time, we get to, we start to accept as true, even though it might not really be true, or it's just a representation of the earth. There is, of course, the possibility that um, the information on a map, you know, might be fudged. Uh, that has happened. Generation after generation of cartographers have designed maps presenting the world as something it's not. In fact, some cartographers have used maps as tools of propaganda. Not all maps, however, were created to steal land or to control an industry. The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. But why would seemingly loyal and dutiful maps want to betray us? 
It all comes down to dimensions. A three-dimensional globe cannot accurately be portrayed by a rectangular two-dimensional map. In other words, you can't square a circle. Geographers have always struggled with the challenge of representing our spherical world on a flat paper. So you can't wrap a globe in paper because you get wrinkles and overlap and it just doesn't work right. But every projection you make, um, I would suggest you replace the word projection with the, the word distortion because that's what it is. You're distorting everything. Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the third world. And so the whole world was Eurocentric, became Eurocentric focused in a way at that time. And so we've just continued with those representations. Map makers continue to take liberties today. Just ask New Zealand. The next great conspiracy. New Zealand is disappearing off-world maps. It may be silly, but New Zealand spearheaded a tourism campaign to have the country return to world maps. Turns out, cartographers and artists around the globe had made a practice of excluding it. New Zealand, where the bloody hell are you? Seemingly germane, the practice appears to have created a crisis within New Zealand's national psyche. There are entire groups dedicated to calling out these oversights. Not to mention similar groups for Madagascar, Denmark, and the Caribbean. So, like I said, any professor knows that world maps are wrong. I mean, even eight-year-old kids know this. The world map is wrong. Okay, so we've either established that this guy is lying to you by telling you to use a world map, which is not correct in the first place, or he's just dumb enough that he doesn't know that. Anyways, let's move on. Where's the scale here? Why do you never include one? Is it because it's impossible? Yes, that is exactly why. And if you disagree, here's your challenge. Pick some distance on this map. A centimeter, an inch, whatever. Tell me the distance it corresponds to in reality. Then pick some cities and use your scale to estimate the distances between them. Pick two on the same continent. Pick two on different continents. Use it to tell me how wide this inappropriately enormous ocean is. Use it to tell me literally anything about the distances between literally anything. When you can't do it and your numbers do not correlate with reality in the slightest, recall that this map does it just fine and then admit that your map is stupid. Okay, once again, we have the little angry teenage girl. Just admit that your map is stupid. Not to mention the fact that he's trying to deceive you by showing you a computer-generated image of a flat earth map instead of a real flat earth map and take a listen to what he said here where's the scale here why do you never include one is it because it's impossible uh no dumb dave it's not because it's impossible it's because you are showing a computer generated image of a flat earth map instead of a real flat earth map which does have a scale on it as you can see here with the Gleason's New Standard Map of the World 1892, which says scientifically and practically correct as it is. But if you'll go right down here to the bottom of the map right here, you see what this is right here? This is called a scale. Okay, this is how you measure distance, dumb Dave. Now, when he tells you guys this, he knows you're not going to investigate it. That's why he's getting away with telling you this. But as you can see here, the upper portion of this scale shows the relations that English or land miles sustain to nautical or sea miles, sometimes called geographical. The lower half shows minutes and degrees of the arc as compared to sun time by laying a straight edge across the scale. It shows the relations of all the divisions. Now, what's that say right there, dumb Dave? It says scale. Okay, so quit telling people that flat earth maps do not have a scale. Now, being that you know this map has a scale, you go buy this map and you cut the scales out and pin them in the middle and measure any distance you want to on this flat earth map and you will debunk your own challenge. And you can learn how to use it like real professors, navigators, and scientists learned to do in 1892 with this map. Anyways, let's let dumb Dave finish what he's got to say about his challenge number one. Your complete inability to make any kind of remotely legitimate map single-handedly proves the Earth isn't flat. But let's continue just for fun. 
Number two. Okay, let me hear that part one more time. Your complete inability to make any kind of remotely legitimate map single-handedly proves the Earth isn't flat. But let's continue just for fun. Okay, let's finish debunking the rest of his first challenge, which is he's stating here there is no legit flat Earth map, which means the Earth is not flat. But dumb Dave, I just showed you a real flat Earth map. Now, let me prove it to you. Okay, as you can see, this is the Gleason's new standard map of the world. It says scientifically and practically correct as it is. Nowhere on this map does it say that this is a projection map of a globe. But you know what it does say? It says new standard map of the world on the projection of J.S. Christopher Modern College Blackheath, England. Now let's go to the University of Milwaukee. Here we are, Gleason's new standard map of the world. And there's an image of the map, but let's go down here below that. Now right down here under item description, full title, Gleason's new standard map of the world on the projection of J.S. Christopher Modern College Blackheath, England, scientifically and practically correct as it is. Short title, Flat Earth, 1892-2013. Now, being that this specific map that I have is from the Boston Public Library, let's go to Boston's Rare Maps and see what they say about Gleason himself and J.S. Christopher, the man who made the map. Okay, Extraordinary Rare 1892 Flat Earth Map by Alexander Gleason. Now, let's stroll down here and see what we got going on. Oh, there's your scale, dumb Dave. Even uh, Google shows you how to use the scale on the Flat Earth map. Now, this is just a description of the map which is on the map. We want to know the details behind the map, the story behind the map. So, like I was saying, as we stroll past uh, the description of the map, what we want to do is go down here. Let me show you here. It says... Things get weird, though, with the description key on the back of the map, which ends with the sentence, the demonstration has reference to either considerations, the earth a globe, or a plane. Take your choice. To make sense of all this, one must refer to Gleason. Is the Bible from heaven? Is the earth a globe? Buffalo, Electrotype and Engraving Company, 1890, with an enlarged second edition in 1893. There, he marshals scripture... Quirkly interpretations of physical science, shoddy observation, and dollops of common sense to argue that the Earth is flat, stationary, and the center of the cosmos. Late in the work, he announces and describes his new map, which is the one that I just showed you guys at the beginning of the video. And here he's just uh, explaining the colors of the map, what all it contains, the continents, the islands, the rivers, and whatnot. But what we want to do is stroll down to here. And it says, in any event, he presumably chose not to mention his flat earth views in the application in order to avoid the risk of rejection by the patent office. Okay, so now here we have Alexander Gleason. Let's stroll down the page here. Okay, Alexander Gleason, November 28th, 1827 to March 13, 1909, when as an American machinist and civil engineer, a proponent in his later years of flat earth theory, and in particular, noted for his new standard map of the world, 1892, the one that we are speaking of, the one that I just showed you. Okay, now let's stroll down here a little further to the press coverage and see what it says. Okay, Buffalo and the Earth, an intelligent journal, says the world is our oyster. Buffalo Commercial, Buffalo, New York, 721, November 1890. Is it any wonder that Alexander Gleason of number 1201 Niagara Street is making an effort to prove that the Earth is flat? Nowadays, nothing seems impossible to a Buffalonian. When Mr. Gleason has successfully demonstrated his theory in regard to our planet, he would doubtless take possession of the earth in the name of his native city. There was a time when Chicago waved the palm for greatest exhibition and municipal claims. The tide of empire, however, has begun to set eastward. Buffalo, the world is yours. Satetic and theoretic defined. Buffalo commercial, Buffalo, New York, 624 March 1893. 
Again, there has arisen in our midst with bold attack upon the present system of astronomy and geodesy, a work of surpassing magnitude by one Alexander Gleason of our own city, published by the Buffalo Electrotype and Engraving Company, and for sale by either of the above name. The work referred to bears of the title, Is the Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? While it is manifest from a moment's glance that to the first interrogation, there is no doubt in the mind of the writer as to the inspiration of the word. In regard to the second, if the diagrams and statistical measurements are correct, there remains some hard shelled nuts for our scientists to crack. So people, as you can see, Alexander Gleason was a flat earther and without a shadow of a doubt, this is his flat earth map and I just gave you the history of the flat earth map and Mr. Gleason. Now let's move on to J.S. Christopher. The subtitle of Gleason's map credits the projection to J.S. Christopher of Modern College Blackheath. Okay, now let's stroll down and see about Christopher. Uh, it says he was born 1805 in Dartmouth, Devon, was a merchant active in the East, blah, 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 blah. Now, at some time in life, Christopher got hooked on Samuel Burley Robotham's Tetetic Astronomy. Now, if you're not familiar with who Samuel Burley Robotham is, he wrote a book in 1864 called Earth Not a Globe. Both the Tetic Astronomy and Christopher's map made their way across the Atlantic and found inheritance here in the United States. Alexander Gleason among them. Somehow Gleason got hold of Christopher's map and republished it. Not once, but twice. And if you look a little further down, it says Gleason's 1885 flat earth map is so rare that only images I find are reproductions such as this one on eBay. His second map of 1892 offered here is almost equally rare. So now that we have established that this is a map of a flat earth, through detailed research that I just showed you and showed you how Alexander Gleason and J.S. Christopher are both flat earthers. And this is their flat earth map. And even the pretty lady here on the news will tell you it's not a projection map of the globe. It's a flat earth map with the North Pole in the center and the ice walls holding everything in. Check it out. The curving horizon, the sloping sea level, the spin of the earth. Unless you can see these phenomena with your own eyes, they may not be true. Unlike what we've been told in school, the earth looks like a snow globe, round but not sphere. The North Pole is at the center of most flat earth maps, with the ice of Antarctica holding everything in. You see, even the news lady knows that this is a flat earth map. Anyways, we have debunked Professor Dumdave's number one challenge. Therefore, that completes this episode of debunking Professor Dumdave. So everyone be sure to join me in episode two, where we debunk his number two challenge. Everyone, thanks for watching. Have a good night and God bless. Dum 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 dum